All right, we're back. <laughs> Welcome to Saturday Storytelling. We are beginning today's program by acknowledging that we are gathered today on the homeland of the Salish Kalispie people at a place they call Simpson Clee. Their example is the original stewards of this land guides our work today. Tribal Trust Connection is committed to respectfully sharing the history and contemporary culture of the indigenous people who lived and traveled through the ancient crossroads on this land. We learn from many indigenous artists, elders, and organizations. We invite you to learn from and support them as well. Um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Molly Stockdale. I'm the Executive Director of Tribal Trust Connection. Uh, a post that I unbelievably have now held for 10 years, somehow. Yeah. Um, so, um, I'm super excited to see people that I know and some new faces in the room and on Zoom. Um, Gail, can I get a wave if everybody on Zoom can hear me and everything seems to be okay? Seems like we're good. Excellent. All right, I'll say a quick thanks to everybody who makes these programs possible. First and foremost, the members of Traveler's Rest Connection. Um, also, our Trailblazer sponsors like Farmer State Bank. And I want to say a thank you to MCAT, Missoula's Community Media Resource, who provided a media assistance grant to record each of the winter storytelling programs. And thanks to Ron's camera in the back of the room, those folks who are joining us on Zoom today also get a pretty clear picture, as opposed to from my computer. Um, a shout out to Hunter Bay Coffee Roasters for today's coffee, and to Hattie Redman, Colleen Frank, and Galen for treats. Thanks. Yeah, yummy. Um, for everybody on Zoom, it's helpful if you keep yourself muted and your video off during the presentation. If you have questions for our speaker, please type them into the chat box on Zoom, and Galen will monitor the chat for questions. Also, you can type in the chat um, if you have any technical difficulties, and she will help talk you through them. Um, for everybody in the room and on Zoom, I wanted to let folks know that our new annual video is running in the Visitor Center, and it's available for viewing on our website. So if you go to travelchest.org, go to the Natural History page, you'll see a spot where you can uh, click play and see all of Dale's amazing photos from the last year. And uh, enjoy the park in its all seasons, even when it's not a season at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Ed Norterio's first book, Montana Curiosities, was published in 2010. The Laugh Out Loud Guide introduced readers to the offbeat people, places, and events of the Treasure State. I have to just interrupt myself here because I was flipping through Montana Curiosities last night, and during this holiday break, my kids finally watched This is Spinal Tap, and the fact that it was quoted in Montana Curiosities just made me very happy. So, it is really a laugh out loud track of that. Um, Terrio continues to explore Montana and bring home interesting stories. In his latest book, Big Sky, Big Parks, Terrio shares his experiences on the road and in the parks with humor and insight in 30 stories that chronicle the triumphs and tragedies that make traveling between Glacier and Yellowstone such a rewarding endeavor. Under the pseudonym Bob Wire, Terrio has written and recorded seven albums of original music and traveled around the state playing guitar in honky tonks and festivals, entertaining crowds, and picking up local knowledge along the way. Ladies and gentlemen, Edward Terrio. Oh, thank you, Molly. It's great to be back down here. I did a, a presentation here about three years ago for Humanities Montana. And it's just, it's such a treat for a writer and storyteller to have an engaged audience who love all the same things I do. So hopefully I can, you know, shed some light on some new information for you and uh, keep you entertained in the process. Uh, as Molly mentioned, my, my, uh, my stage name is Bob Wire, and I've been playing around the area for a while. And uh, although due to COVID, I had a trio, the trio did not survive COVID. So uh, the guys were like, you know, kind of like this staying at home thing. <laughs> so, so I've been playing solo for a while. I haven't played with other people for three years until last night. Got together in a basement at a guy's house and three guys I don't know. You know, I just met one guy and uh, come on. Well, you know, so I told him my name. I, I said, I'm Ednor, you know, so we'll do this. And 
we play for like three hours just jamming on stuff, and, and this bass player says, you know, you, this was pretty fun. Your voice, you know, you sound like, uh, you sound a lot like uh, Bob Wire. <laughs> And I, the, the guy who knew who I was was doubled over with laughter. I said, Bob Wire, huh? I heard he's kind of a hack. You think I... He goes, oh, you're Bob Wire. Yeah, so that was a highlight of my night, but I just had to share that with you. So as Molly mentioned, uh, thank you for that great introduction, Molly, by the way. This is my latest book, Big Sky, Big Parks. And uh, I think it's my best work so far. I've got seven, seven books under my belt, and this was... was the funnest one to research, the funnest one to write, and yet it also has uh, some very serious stories that I cover. And I can't keep humor out of my work, whether I'm writing, doing graphic design, or uh, doing music, but some things demand a lot more serious approach and a lot more respect, and I think you'll find that I, I balance that pretty well in this book. I feel pretty good about that. But the idea for the book came around. I've been living in Missoula for 30 years, so we've, we've gone to... Uh, Yellowstone is kind of our place. And uh, I'm getting to know Glacier, but I've been there maybe six, seven times, enough to know that there's even a difference between the people that go to the two parks, people that have an affinity for Glacier and people that have, are more into Yellowstone, no matter where they live. And I found this out talking to uh, uh, Carl Olson at the new library. I was talking to him about Sperry, Law, Sperry Chalet in Glacier. That's his place. And a lot of people say that is the finest, hiking to Sperry and staying there is the finest experience in any of the 63 national parks. And I have never been, but I had to write, it, or write about it as if I had, but carefully word it so they would hold up in court that I never claimed to, <laughs> to be there. So my friend Carl's given me all these details and just how, why he loves it and what's special about it. And I, I interviewed many, many people who had been there and what their experiences were. And uh, so I asked Carl, well, do you have a similar place in Yellowstone you and your people go to? He goes, oh, we're not Yellowstone people. Oh. <laughs> just, I said, oh, ding. So I have a story that just came out in uh, Mountain Outlaw magazine, Yellowstone people versus glacier people. And so it's, it's kind of a humor piece, but there are things that I noticed, the differences between two parks. Uh, my wife and I got to, right when I finished the manuscript for this, we celebrated by staying at uh, uh, Many Glacier Hotel, which I had never stayed at, and it's, I, th I believe it's the oldest hotel in the park and the most spectacular. We, we were there for three days, and it blew our minds. Of course, we celebrated me finishing the manuscript, assuming that I would, because I had to book this a year in advance. But while we were there, we decided to celebrate and have a really nice dinner in the big dining room, no holds barred, money's no object. We're waiting uh, in the lobby for them to seat us. We're, we're having dinner at five, man, early. We're gonna beat the crowd. By the time we come out from dinner, the, the lobby is packed. People are on a two hour waiting list. And here's Phil Jackson, the basketball coach, standing at the, the, uh, the, the uh, maitre d's lectern uh, reading the menu. And I walk by him. And, and I clock, it's Phil Jackson. I look down, there's a small blonde woman sitting on a bench next to him, and she looks at me, and the look she gives me is, was such an incredible human experience. Uh, it, the look said, yes, that's Phil Jackson. Thank you for not saying anything and interrupting us. Yeah, I put up with this all the time. <laughs> all this was said in a tenth of a second, and I walked on, and I'm sitting with my wife, that was Phil Jackson. And she's like, is he a guitar player? <laughs> it's, no, he was the coach of the Lakers. And the, so, I, so on the way back to my room, I'm getting a cell uh, signal. So I text my buddy, Chip Whitson, who is my music partner, just saw Phil Jackson in the, the lobby at you know, Mini Glacier Hotel. And he's like, Phil Jackson, oh my God, was he wearing all his championship rings to dinner? I said, man, only has 10 fingers, son. And, <laughs> <laughs> my wife says, enough's enough. Let's, let's get on with vacation. So that's, that's one of my Yellowstone stories. And uh, this has uh, not so much personal stories. Of, I'm sorry, the glacier stories. Not so much personal adventures and stories and experiences, but a lot of history and culture 
and things to look for when you're there and things you might not realize about certain areas around both the national parks. Of course, we claim Yellowstone as our own, even though 97% of it's in Wyoming. But I, I'm sorry, what was that TV show named uh, Wyoming? Yeah, okay, anyway, it's, we're, we're taking it. So what I'm trying to encourage is people who come to Montana to visit both the parks, build in some extra time into your visit and check out all the Montana in between the parks. It's a day's drive and there are a hundred different itineraries you can build, a hundred ways to get there. I call this area the Montana Swath. So there's a section about uh, Glacier, section about Yellowstone, section about the Montana Swath. There are sidebars about regional foods you can try like uh, huckleberries, pasties, uh, Rocky Mountain oysters, which I point out are not shellfish to anybody who's an outsider. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a fun book. And the, the editor that I worked with, at first when I pro proposed the book to uh, Globe Pequod, who I have a great relationship with, my editor said, I said, well, okay, I'm gonna, I, I don't know, got an idea for the book. It's gonna be like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, only about the national parks. I'll talk about all the bad behavior and this and that, and it's called, it's called Tourist Trap. And she says, you know, I, I don't think the parks are gonna sell a book in the bookshops that are called Tourist Trap, for one thing. Uh, go back to the drawing board and try again. So I, I came back and I, I changed it. It's like, okay, I wanna do a travel guide that only is about the two parks and all the Montana, Montana in between. It's for people coming to check out both parks on one trip. We'll call it Double Dip. She says, okay, that's, uh, that's stupid. <laughs> I'm leaving the, she left the company shortly after and went and started her own thing. So she, she says, try this other editor. So the other editor got it. She said, look, you don't do a travel guide that tells people where to stay, how much to pay, this and that. There are hundreds of those out there already. You have a voice, use your voice, tell stories. That's why people buy your books. Like, okay, so she turned me loose and there is, uh, a sidebar in here of, of playlists, of songs to play as you're traveling in this area. Uh, what album fits the scenery? As, as a musician, my windshield is a movie screen. And I always have music going at, at, at pretty high volume. And things just tend to match up with the scenery. Like, have you ever watched, watched a football game, turn the sound off and put on a Miles Davis record? You don't even have to do drugs. It, 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 it'll blow your mind. But that's what this is. The scenery and the music match up from time to time. And I thought, you know, this thing, I was driving up uh, the hill outside of Ravalli. You go past Ravalli, you can, you can go uh, west on 200 towards Thompson Falls and Hot Springs, or you go straight up the hill. Uh, we call it the, the uh, Bison Range Hill because the bison range is right there at the left. As you crest the hill, there's the Mission Mountains. Ah! So I happened to be listening to uh, Phil Collins in the air tonight as I came through a valley. Somehow this happened, yeah. The song goes on for two and a half minutes, go through a valley, chugging up the hill. As soon as we crested the hill, it gets to the do 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 And it's like, oh, I, I, I literally cried. I was weeping tears. And it just like, okay, I, my wife was with me and I said, I gotta put this in the book. She goes, well, how are you gonna do that? Okay, go back through her valley. I made her drive back to the other side of her valley and, then we, and I timed it backwards. I'll be smart. I'm gonna start at the top of the hill, go backwards. While we're going downhill in my four cylinder Honda, of course we're going 75 on the way down. <laughs> so we come back, okay, okay, started at this mile marker. And we come back through her valley. Okay, keep it to the speed limit. Okay, now speed up up the hill. She's like, it's floored, baby. <laughs> so it's like way before the tops. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh no, turn around, get, turn around. This poor woman, she had to do this five times. <laughs> and when the book came out, I realized, by then I realized this is ridiculous. You know, I say drop the needle as you make the last turn. It's like, it's, it's never gonna match up. And a lot of people don't have a record player in their car. <laughs> But uh, I, there are two songs I, I tried to do that to on that same drive as you go to Polson. There's another song and another place you start it. But, but other, uh, that's what the book is to me, just a big sandbox where I can have some fun. And I, I tend to write the kind of books I want to read. 
so that you guys will have a good time reading it, whether you're in the parks, on the road, uh, holed up in your house in the winter with a fire, dreaming about getting back to Glacier or Yellowstone. Here, you know, you live in Montana, you live in Western Montana. Here are a few things you've never heard of. Uh, I had not been to Sluice Box State Park and I'd seen videos and photos and heard stories that friends from Great Falls, it's five miles south of Great Falls. One of the most beautiful state parks we have, I think we have about 53 state parks and it is gorgeous. I was there at the end of June, I had the place to myself and you can hike along the Belt River, Belt Creek for about 10, 12 miles on this, this trail. And uh, there was nobody there and it's, it's beautiful weather and the, the stream is one of the most gorgeous waterways in the entire state, the Belt River. As, as you get down south of there, uh, I, I drove along that river. That's where I saw these historic signs that said this was the uh, Yellowstone Glacier Beeline. You know, and so they figured out what's the fastest route between Glacier and Yellowstone, and all these businesses promoted it, and they would have signs, and their shops would be on the way. And so then I read that, I thought, I put that in the introduction. It's like, the fastest way to get between the two parks? That is exactly the wrong thing to do. What's the point? You know, it, it, people that I see in Yellowstone, I know they have the cruise control on. It's like, come on, man. Slow it down. You got to look for a traffic jam. As soon as you get in the park, you're not looking for a bear jam. You're not looking for animals. You're looking for cars. Where are all the cars stopped? Well, that's where I'm going to stop because they're looking at something. And that's how that works. So the idea for this book, I, probably the germ was planted f from an article I wrote for Montana Magazine, the late lamented Montana Magazine that uh, went down in flames along with the Independent back when uh, Lee... The name, I don't, uh, for, Lee is a four-letter word to journalists. But uh, I wrote an article for Montana Magazine. They approached me and said, hey, we, we saw your Curiosities book, and, you know, what do you think about writing, like, a, a humor article comparing the historic yellow bus of Yellowstone to the Red Jammer bus of Glacier? You know, check out those two buses. Spoiler alert, they're exactly the same bus. What is it? It's a 1936 white Model 706. They, they took the shell and put them on a modern Ford van chassis. So they're all modern and safe, up to code. Uh, but all the, from the wheels up, they're the old school refurbished 1936 bus. I love these buses. They're iconic. Somehow I wangled my way into the shotgun seat on both buses in both parks. Got to drive the length of going to the Sun Road and back with one of these brilliant, all the tour guides in the national parks are biologists, geologists, historians, and part stand-up comic, and especially in Glacier, uh, like Indy One level skilled drivers. These guys are amazing. You know, as they're going along the road, and and they got the you know AT and T man help you uh, mic microphone here, like. Well, if you look over there, sit that giant mountain. You know, you ever, you know, you ever watch like a oh, Paramount movie when uh, <laughs> it's like it comes on and it, there's the the iconic uh, mountain and well, that's not it. They had to make that up and everybody's ah, oh, you're, you're ah, oh. and then uh, so the guy, this was great. It's because sitting in the the uh, shotgun seat, you hear all the asides. When I was traveling with a guy in Yellowstone in the yellow bus, we pulled into a parking lot, peak of the summer. There's nowhere to park, but he sees a tour bus getting ready to pull out. Big, those giant, you know, Greyhound-sized jobs. Uh, this guy's just waiting. Everybody's getting a little antsy to get out and go see, you know, Steamboat guys or wherever we were. And uh, this, this, the bus is waiting on one lady. We can all see out the window. She comes off the boardwalk, and she starts walking down the parking lot toward the bus at this shallow angle. And this, this guy looks at me, covers his mic, says, if these a-holes ever learn how to cross a parking lot, we get out of here in time. Okay, over on your right, you're gonna see some, some bison out there. I'm like, oh, this is gold, this is gold. <laughs> Excuse me, so I'm still, I'm holding out, still holding out hope for fear and loathing in Yellowstone, which seems to be kind of the tour on center of all the national parks and uh, I'm gonna, uh, there, there's, uh, some of the more serious stories in here, there are some that you never heard of and some that you have. 
<coughs> excuse me, but the ones, uh, the more well-known stories, I thought, well, one in particular, Glacier National Park, that always intrigued me was the disappearance of the Whitehead brothers in 1923, I believe. 1924, 100 years ago now. Uh, these two brothers from Chicago had ridden the train out to Glacier, had an itinerary, hiked around for a few days, went to the Belton Chalet, uh, up into the backcountry. Uh, on their last hike, a 30-mile hike down to uh, Lake McDonald, they disappeared. And they were never found again. And no trace. And this, to me, was... I, I had read many accounts of this story, including uh, Montana, the, the magazine of Western History, which is the Historical Society's, Society's House magazine. It, that's the most heavily researched magazine there is in Montana. So I read it, and I thought, well, I'm not reading much about the Whitehead brothers themselves. Who were these guys? So I decided to dig into that aspect. So I'm going to read you just the intro to uh, what happened to the Whitehead brothers. In the summer of 1924, the city of Chicago was in the doldrums. Citizens were horrified by a shocking kidnapping and murder committed by a pair of university frat boys named Nathaniel Leopold and Richard Loeb. Leopold and Loeb, that was that year. They wanted to demonstrate their superior intellect by abducting and killing someone, believing they could get away with the perfect crime. They murdered a 14-year-old boy, dumped his body in a culvert 25 miles south of Chicago, and began sending ransom notes to the victim's parents. Their plan unraveled, and within two weeks, the pair were caught, confessed to the crime, and were sentenced to life plus 99 years in prison. Excuse me. The chill produced that summer by the crime of the century wasn't as cold as the icy winter winds that blow across the city from Lake Michigan, but it was close. Chicago baseball fans had another shadow cast over their summer as their beloved White Sox were on their way to finishing at the absolute bottom of the American League for the first time in their history. Comiskey Park was more like a funeral parlor than a major league stadium. Just when everybody could use a stiff drink, Prohibition had driven alcohol consumption underground, and Chicago was struggling in the bloody grip of organized crime. Was it any wonder that a hard-working man like Joseph Whitehead wanted to get out of town for a couple weeks? The clean-cut 29-year-old engineer had a good job at the Universal Battery Company. Sorry. His $400 a month salary enabled him to support his newly widowed mother, his sister, and younger brother William, 22, who was attending MIT in Boston. Perhaps Joe was feeling the weight of his responsibilities and the hot, grim Chicago summer spurred the need to recharge his own batteries. A few days of fresh air and hiking through Glacier National Park must have been just the tonic he needed. Young William probably jumped at the chance for a bit of adventure with his big brother before returning to the campus for his final year. The Whitehead brothers packed their gear, kissed their mother and sister goodbye, and left Union Station aboard the Great Northern Railroad's newly refurbished Oriental Limited in mid-August. When the boys failed to return on September 1st, Dora Whitehead immediately contacted park authorities and reported her sons missing. Chief Ranger James P. Brooks took charge of the case, which would eventually lead to the biggest manhunt in National Park Service history. Everyone from park rangers and veteran trappers to J. Edgar Hoover and President Calvin Coolidge wanted to find out what happened to the Whitehead brothers. So I go on into the chapter to, to get into the case and uh, really kind of trace the boys' steps. I had a map pinned to my wall where I drew their path. It culled from all the different uh, information I could find right to the very last pin in the, in the map where they disappeared. And I uh, filed a Freedom of Information Act with the FBI so I could get into the records at Glacier National Park in the park library. And uh, I got approval during COVID. So I, the, the library is like a, does anybody have, have like a two-butt kitchen in their house? It's only two people can fit in the kitchen. That's how small the library is. The library says, if I'm here, you can't come in. So you can't come in anyway. What do you need? So she found 
uh, she sent me photos of a lot of the materials from the FBI files where I could see the postcards and letters uh, that the mother had received. These two boys wrote their mother every day when they were in Glacier Park, sending postcards from the hotel where they were staying, uh, letters on the hotel stationery, and then the letters stopped coming. So uh, it was really kind of a thrill as a researcher and writer to actually hold those letters in my hand. And I can, I can quote some stuff that haven't appeared in other books and other stories about this. And it's still astonishing to me, 100 years from now, with the technology we have, uh, forensic science, uh, no one's ever turned up so much as a button from these guys. There's all the theories about were they eaten by bears, did they fall off a cliff, did they drown in the lake? Uh, one popular theory was, well, they probably left the park through West Glacier, hooked up with some rum runners from Canada, and started a new life north of the border. It's as feasible as anything else, because nothing's ever been found and no witnesses have ever come forth. Now, you know, anybody who was around there is long gone, so it's kind of a, it's a cool mystery, but it's, when you're going up to Yellowstone, it, I'm sorry, to Glacier, I do this all the time. When you're going to Glacier, uh, you can kind of, once you know this story and it comes up here and there, it helps put in context where you are. It's like hey, the Whitehead brothers may have been on this very trail, you know, so keep your eyes peeled for buttons. <laughs> so uh, one of the fun things uh, about this, I, I'm really happy to see a, a lot of, a, a few old friends down here and, and people that I've seen at my, my talks. And it's really gratifying to know that you, you guys are into this as much as I am. And I have a friend here who I just wrote a story about uh, for a magazine about his collection of vintage lures, fishing lures. And uh, they're hanging from his ceiling in his office, like a couple hundred lures. And man, you walk in there and it is, you're a little off balance. <laughs> but it is so cool. I got some great photos and he tells stories about, every lure has a story. You found them all on the beach up at Flathead Lake. Just 30 years of lures. And so I could just find these stories that I think other people would be interested in too. But the good thing for me is I have so many great, interesting friends. I just write stories about my friends. So it, it's, it's kind of a good job. I just have to figure out how to get exploited so I can make some money at it. <laughs> so one of the, I, I interviewed several friends who I knew had done this in Glacier uh, before they, they opened uh, going to the Sun Road when the plowing gets done. Uh, I think in, in, was it last year? Was the latest it had ever opened, July 23rd. They didn't open it in Logan Pass until July 23rd. Before then, you can ride bikes up from uh, uh, Apgar, from that area. And uh, people love to do this. In the spring, the sun is out, it's nice. But when you get to the top, it might be a snowstorm. You've got to be ready for anything, any month of the year in Glacier Park. So this was really always the domain of serious cyclists who can repair their bikes in the wilderness, who can take care of themselves. And uh, they kind of know when you get up there, it's going to be wet. And when you come back down and you're, you know, just screaming, you might get hypothermia just from water evaporating off of your body. So they're, they're prepared, they're knowledgeable. Now we have electric bikes. Now anybody can rent an electric bike. I have one uh, friend who used to love riding up there in the spring and seeing all our biker friends. And she said, you know, I got to... I love the idea of the electric bikes because it opens it up and makes it more accessible to more people. I firmly believe that it's a national park. It does belong to all of us. That's one part of the issue is that this allows people who normally aren't able for whatever reason to get up there on a bike, now they can experience this. Uh, on the negative side is now anybody can get up there. Kind of a double-edged sword. People go, this, this woman told me, you know, it's, I love the idea, but it's a little disconcerting for me huffing and puffing and somebody kind of putt-putts by me with a big huckleberry shake in her cup holder. <laughs> Just, hello. The, the real problem, though, is, it's beyond the congestion and all that, is it's, it's a safety issue. And another friend I have, what, he worked in search and rescue, and he's a hardcore camper, cyclist, outdoor enthusiast. He's really disgusted with the whole movement because he says, now this is gonna pull a lot of resources 
from the park up there to rescue people. Uh, people will get up there and uh, they have flip-flops and shorts and a tank top and they think it's going to be fun to coast back down. But, they, you know, he said uh, one, one guy he knew went up there and he had a burrito with him. And on the way back down, he wrapped his feet in the foil from the burrito to try to keep his feet warm. <laughs> this, is, this is what they're dealing with. It's a complex issue. And the, what I try to do is find as many viewpoints as I can, as many stories as I can get out of people, lay it out so the reader has all, you know, all stories from both sides. And the reader can make up their own mind. I don't really say this is right or this is wrong. That's my training in journalism kind of helps me keep that check on my own writing. If it is something that's my opinion, it's very clear. And it's usually not a serious issue like that. But I think that the book is a good mix of uh, just funny stories and things that have happened to me when I'm out there. And my favorite stories are the ones that happen during the research that don't make it into the book. Uh, I have a chapter on uh, all the state parks you can visit on the way between Glacier and Yellowstone. And one of the tiniest and uh, newest state parks is, is the Anaconda Stack State Park in Anaconda. And it's right there at the foot of the stack. It's, it's a little tiny city park that has a couple of nice sculptures and there's a wall of bricks that are engraved with the people who donated money to make it happen. Uh, it's just uh, a couple of trees. There's really no shade there in the summer, but the, the big feature is the re replica of the rim of the stack. It's the, exactly the same. I think it's about 60 feet in diameter, the top of the stack, and it's about four feet high and it goes around and in the middle, it's all filled with uh, sand, but it's that black slag that those big mountains of slag are there uh, outside of Anaconda that are a byproduct of the smelting. So uh, what I love to tell people from out of state when I, when I tell them about this park, if you're, hey, you're going through Anaconda, stop and see this park. There's a replica of the, the stack there. And oh yeah, I've seen it. it. It's like that stack. I said, oh no, it's the whole stack. It's just buried. You're looking at the... <laughs> it's the most expensive park we've ever made in Missoula. No, that stack is big enough where you could put the uh, Washington Monument inside it. It's the biggest brick structure in the world, and I'm glad that it's still standing. Uh, there's a little chapter in here about, uh, uh, if you go into Yellowstone, there's a few things. Probably my favorite thermal feature now in Yellowstone Park is called the Devil's Punch Bowl. Actually, it's called, the, it's called Punch Bowl Spring because there was a movement in the early part of the 20th century where, uh, oh, he, he was a uh, surveyor came in. He had a lot of power and he wanted to take away all the devil-themed names and Satan-themed names from all the features in the park. That Yeah, it's like there's the devil's hoof. There's, uh, I don't know if it was the devil's steps. The, as you leave through Gardner and go up to Paradise Valley, you can see the Devil's Slide right there. Great geological feature. So a lot of these names have survived, uh, but uh, the Devil's Punch Bowl, I, I, I'm going to call it that until the day I die, because it's just off the main path of the geyser walk around uh, the upper geyser basin where Old Faithful is. Everybody goes to see Old Faithful, and there's, you can look across the basin and see dozens of geysers and hot pools going off at any given time. And it's about a two hour walk if you do all the paths, you go all the way to, out to Morning Glory, which is just a gorgeous, gorgeous hot pool. But then if you go off the path a little bit to the left, I think you cut over toward the road, you go past the Devil's Punch Bowl. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if I got a photo of it in here, but it's, it's perfectly round. And uh, the center, which is the, the rock material that these geysers and pools form, come up about a foot. And it's just utterly symmetrical, round, with about a foot high rim. And it's got that beautiful kind of Coke bottle colored water that goes to a deeper cyan. And nobody's there. Nobody really bothers with it or knows about it. So you could just hang out, and it's not that big. It's probably the size of an average, a uh, little bigger than a, a, 
a hot pool you find on somebody's deck, hot tub. But uh, it appeals to me because of the symmetry and the, the perfection, and it just it feeds my OCD like I, I can't believe. It was great. So we always have to check that out. So I'm, uh, I've been approached to work on a story about the, the, the roads in Montana and the history of when they became paved roads. And I'm thinking, okay, where's the sexy part or the funny part or the interesting part to that? I'll have to figure that out. But it reminded me there is, I did write, write down the history of developing uh, Yellowstone's uh, Grand Loop Road, which is the big, you know, connects every major feature in the park. And uh, this road took, to get to the point where it is today, it's, you've been to Yellowstone, it's constantly under construction somewhere. Because this road takes a beating, especially in the winter, and they can't work on it in the winter, so part of it's usually closed down while they work on it, especially after the flood of uh, two summers ago. Uh, so much of that road was washed out, they said that, well, to get from Gardner to Mammoth, that's going to be five years. They had, they had the alternate road fixed by the end of that fall. The old Gardner road, they beefed it up. They brought in another crew that happened to be in Yellowstone working on a different road, said, okay, you're done with that. Get up here. We got to get this thing, this road, to the point where it can support regular tourist traffic. I think they, they didn't get it to where it could hold, uh, you know, like the 24-foot RVs and things like that but people could get back and forth to their jobs in between Gardner and Mammoth. The staff could get in and out of the park. They could get supplies. And then by October, the general public could come into the park through that uh, entrance, which uh, I think it blew even the Park Service away that this happened so fast. But the road, the original road down the Gardner Canyon along the Gardner River you all saw the famous videos while that flood was going on. The, the road was gone. It had been taken out by the river. And this road had, that roadbed had been there long enough that it used to you know, hold stagecoaches and wagons and horse traffic into the park. I, I think nature said, all right, enough's enough. Uh, it's time for the 500-year uh, flood, which happened on the park's 150th anniversary. Good timing. So that, they're going to have to reroute that entire, that entire section of road. They can't just rebuild it where it is. You know, I, I would love to say that, uh, yeah, as a country and as government, we, we learn from our mistakes, but I didn't come up here to lie. <laughs> Another story that I had to tell was, was has been told, but uh, I wanted to talk to a lot of people who were there. Uh, is anybody here from Butte, Montana? So you grew up going to Butte's Disneyland, which was Columbia Gardens. Oh, everybody I talk to uh, about Columbia Gardens, we, we talk about Butte, then we get to the Columbia Gardens, they get a dreamy look on their face, just like this. This was Butte's little amusement park built among this beautiful horticultural paradise, uh, there was a guy who grew up in Butte said, it was the only good thing about Butte, the only good thing about Butte. It's like, wow. And kids would take the, the free trolley and go out there just, uh, I believe it was just the other side of I-15 in that, there was a gulch up there. Uh, I, I'm having a hard time finding the exact place because the Anaconda, Anaconda Company uh, in the 70s, by then, Butte was in, a, in a, a bust phase. The town was emptying out. The bottom had dropped out of the copper market. Uh, Anaconda, Anaconda Company was reportedly, allegedly, burning down their old buildings to, to, uh, to claim the land so they could mine further into the city. People were burning down their own homes to collect the insurance and get the hell out of Butte. It was sad, it was crazy, it was weird. Uh, all they had left was Columbia Gardens, which was really, had kind of trickled down to where it was a financial burden for the company to keep it open. So one Monday night in, uh, I think it was 1972, it burned to the ground, mysteriously. 
And uh, everybody was up in arms. It was, this was like, in a way, no disrespect, this is like Pearl Harbor for the kids in Butte. It's something they'll never forget, something that just, just broke their heart. To this day, I, I didn't even live there. I have a hard time get, not getting choked up about it. <laughs> but it's, I, I told the story of that and got some quotes from people who said, oh, yeah, the Anaconda Company, are you kidding me? We had a brand new fire truck in Butte, and in the first year it had 40,000 miles on it. What does that tell you? <laughs> so, okay, I'll, I'm not going to answer that question, but I'll put the quote in the book and let the reader figure it out. <laughs> but to me, it was such a fascinating story, and I love telling the human element of it. And there was a guy, there's a great little short documentary about the incident. And there was a guy in the documentary who said, yeah, they burned it down. Then they, they uh, started mining that section of the, the pit. And I tell you what, they got, I got more gold in my mouth right now than they found up there. I thought, that man, that's a good quote there. <laughs> uh, let's see, another, another thing I wrote about in here was uh, Hungry Horse Dam and the building of the dam. And that was, that was such a big deal especially in the northwest part of the state, it employed so many people, and uh, just, it led to the, uh, the ability of uh, Columbia, I'm sorry, uh, I'm blanking on it, Columbia Falls Aluminum Company. They couldn't have existed without this incredible source of cheap water. Yeah, so... Uh, now, they came up there, and now a lot of, because of their environmental footprint and kind of a disastrous ending, that whole thing went, went south. And uh, all these stories tend to be tied together through history, and they affect a lot of people. And a lot of our, you know, our predecessors in Montana, I, uh, my uh, grandmother's grandparents homesteaded in 1887 on Douglas Creek over by... Uh, between Phillipsburg and Drummond, right off Flint Creek, there's a, in the Flint Creek Valley, and I still have family over there. It's like they've, they've never left. They're like barnacles. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was a military kid, so I lived, I lived everywhere, but, you know, I've been coming to Missoula my whole life, visiting my relatives, and, uh, you know, it be, kind of became time to settle down, thinking about having kids, which I said I would never have kids till I'm done being one. But I hit about my mid-30s, I was like, I don't think that's going to happen. I better start thinking about procreating. So where, where else but Western Montana, you know, to settle down and have kids and uh, two kids that, that grew up here and, you know, they're doing great. And it's just, I, why, would I, why would you not live in your favorite place in the world? And that's why I'm here. And I will never run out of things to write about, about Montana, as I say. And... Uh, there, I have a book called Haunted Montana that's, that's for sale out here. I'll have, I should say I'll have a few books uh, that I can sell you if you like. I can take uh, cash, check, credit cards, Venmo. If there's a way for you to give me money, I've figured it out. <laughs> so I'll see you after the, after the talk out there in the lobby, and I can, I can sign them for you. But uh, one of the things I wrote was uh, uh, I have to... I have to Oh, whoops, I just uh, blew out everybody's ears, sorry. Uh, Ellen Baumler, who is a personal hero of mine, just passed away in Helena. And she has written more than a dozen books about ghost stories and hauntings and paranormal. And they're all tied to history because she was the interpretive historian at the Montana Historical Society for decades. She is a giant and just such an inspiration to me. And my editor contacted me and said, we just uh, bought the title Haunted Montana, and would you like to write a book about ghost stories? And I'm like, where do I sign? So the thing about ghost stories is everybody, everybody has an experience with a ghost or they know somebody who does, no matter where you go, Florida, China, I don't care. So anywhere I go in Montana, I'm gonna find this really easily. So I let people tell me their story, uh, I put it in a narrative so that it's, it's easy to follow. I dig into the history that might have led to this particular experience. Then I couch the story in the history and, again, let the reader make up their mind. Is this a real thing? Did this really happen? And first thing I did when I got the contract signed was drove to Helena,
got an audience with Ellen Baumler in her office, introduced myself, and uh, she said, you know, you sound a lot like Bob Wire. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> that's, that's called a callback. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I told her what I was doing and, uh, and how I do it, and she said, okay, you're doing this right. And I was just so flattered, and we talked, she shared some personal experiences with me that she'd had with run-ins with ghosts that she had never written about. And I just felt like I've got the Ellen Baumler stamp of approval, so it's okay to work her turf a little bit. But uh, again, with uh, the ghost stories, my favorite stories were the ones that happened when I was researching a certain thing. My, uh, uh, anybody who's been to Phillipsburg has seen the Phillipsburg Opera House, which is over 100 years old, excuse me, and now it uses a theater, and any small theater, any theater, the legend is it has a ghost. And uh, so my son did some summer stock. He's a stage actor, and he's now living in Chicago, trying to make a go of it there. He did a summer season in Phillipsburg, and his, a couple of his friends were on the staff, and one of the guys had told me a story about something that happened to him in there late one night when he was in there alone. And I thought, this, this is absolutely book material. So I wrote his story. And then I was driving home through Phillipsburg one afternoon. I was, I think, coming home from uh, so, some other thing in the area, looking something up. And I thought, well, I'll see if anybody's around the theater. It was, it was after the season. It was in the fall. The manuscript was due in two days, and I need, if I can get one more story in here. So I parked by the side of the theater, nobody was there, and I just kind of stood around, have my notebook, and I'm trying to think, well, who, do I find who owns a building, or uh, call my son and find out who the manager is? And a guy comes around the corner, and he says, uh, you need something? And I said, well, I was kind of hoping to get in, find out you know, who's in charge of the theater so I can get in and look around. He goes, well, I'm managing it. We, uh, our nonprofit group just took it over. You want to go inside? Oh, my God. He, he says, what are you looking for? I said, well, I'm writing ghost stories. He goes, we're in the alley. He goes, feel this. <laughs> and I'm like, what, the wall? The, yeah, so I, I put my hand on the brick wall. He goes, you feel that? What, uh, brick? <laughs> he says, this place is a ghost. Uh, come on in, I'll show you. So, <laughs> We go in, he takes me up on the stage, and we, you know, it's big, high, super high ceiling, just an old, beautiful, classic, refurbished theater. And uh, we're up on the stage, and he says, now every, every uh, theater has a ghost in it, that's why we have these ghost lights. And he reaches behind a wall, and there's the panel, he, he flips these light, lights on, two little tiny, you know, the candelabra bulbs light up on the uh, proscenium sides of the, the theater. And, and he says, also, there's probably ghosts down. Uh, we, we've had some sightings down in the dressing rooms in the prop area. Well, let's go. So we go downstairs, and the, there's two dressing rooms. And it's, I'm already creeped out. And here's all the props and costumes and mannequins. And, and I'm just waiting for this guy to whatever. <laughs> and so he's, we're down there looking around. And uh, we come back up on the stage, and he starts telling me how uh, a little bit about the nonprofit. They're gonna, we're going to have music in here, and maybe you can you get your buddy Bob Wire to come down and play some music. And, <laughs> and uh, he, he's, he's showing me the balcony, and he stops. He goes, oh, my God. And I said, what? It, it, that fan. And there's a ceiling fan way up at the very top, and it's slowly turning. And I said, it's probably like, is there a door open? No, I, I locked the door. I said, what's up? He said, that fan hasn't worked in 10 years. The previous owners had electricians up there trying to fix it. We've had somebody up there looking at it. We just gave up on it. And that's all he said. And we both looked up there, and it was like, oh. <laughs> wait, wait a second. Is it on the same circuit as the ghost lights? No, no. He turns the ghost lights off, and the fan, <laughs> So I asked, asked him to show me the bathroom immediately. <laughs> but these, I, I just love these stories that uh, 
you know, that affect me personally. When I write a book like this, I come out the other side. Uh, for one thing, when I go in, I'm not really, I'm pretty open to the book telling me what it's going to be. And I wrote a book called Seven Montanas. And this was, the idea was, this came out in 2019. It was my first hardback. And the idea was I'd travel around to the, the state is chopped up into six regions, uh, Missouri River Country, Russell Country, Glacier Country, and so forth, according to the tourism board. There's six regions. And my idea was, well, it could be six different states. They're all so wildly different. It could be 10 different states. You know what? I'm going to write a book called Six Montanas, and I'm going to go to each region, investigate that region, do a thin slice on one or two issues. What's your... What's your uh, conflict with nature here. Is it uh, grizzlies? Is it wolves? Is it, uh, you know, elk? Is it bison? Uh, what's, what's the deal with this part of the state? What's your economic engine? What's the culture? You know, it, and just write about the difference, but, but, but also what are the things that we have in common that make us all live in Montana? So that was the idea for the book, and my editor said, you know what? I like it. We'll do it, but... I have to tell you, seven Montanas sounds better than six Montanas. It's just a, just a cooler number. I'm like, you know what? You are absolutely right. Uh, I, can't agree. I can't disagree. She said, you come up with the seventh Montana, we got, it. We got a deal. So uh, that was, uh, the seventh is the conceptual Montana. I asked people from all over the state, what, what do you want to see in 10 years? What do you need to see Montana become 10 years from now? And I got seven wildly different answers. And that was that that book became, it started out as kind of an a expanded curiosities thing, but the, I wrote about how the Blackfoot, the Blackfeet tribe bought the city of Browning. A tribe had never bought a town in, in this country. And so they just wanted to get the water system so they could have water. You know, there's nothing more nefarious than that. And a lot of people in this part of the state or in Billings or in Wolf Point, they never heard of that. So it's like I'm bringing the stories from other parts of the state back to my part or showing the people in Plentywood, hey, we had a dam at a confluence of two rivers that was so packed with toxic garbage that if that dam broke and it was failing, this stuff would have rushed downstream and ruined, you know, the drinking water for the second biggest city in the state. Nobody up here knows about that. So... That's what that book became, and I think it's, it's, it's a good way to help you learn more about your own state. And uh, in all these books, I encourage people to travel around, talk to people. Everybody in here has a great story. They're, you're just waiting for somebody to ask you to tell it. It's like that all over the state with everybody. So that's, I'm kind of the nosy guy who comes around and asks you to tell your story so that I can respectfully tell it and share it with others. And... Help us learn more about just the very place that we live and that we love. So uh, are there uh, any questions or have I used up all the oxygen in the room? <laughs> Is that? Where are you appearing next? I tell you what, I've just spent uh, 10 days sleeping on an a air mattress in my daughter's old room because my wife has COVID, so I'm glad just to be out of the house. But she's, she tests, she's, I'm negative, I tested yesterday, uh, I've managed to avoid it. Uh, where am I going to appear next? I have, actually, let's see, uh, I'm playing music as Bob Wire at Imagination Brewing in uh, mid-February. Um, and it's basically the same spiel, only set to music. <laughs> same dad jokes, you know. Uh, let's see. I just, I just nailed down a, a gig doing a Montana's, I'm sorry, Humanities Montana. I'm on their Speakers Bureau. So you can book me to come to your organization or group, and I have a great presentation called Finding Montana where it has a video accompaniment it's, that, I, that I show all these scenes from around the state tell some of these stories of my travels. I think you pay them 75 bucks and they pay all my expenses. And I, I go anywhere. I'm going to Sydney, Montana in June to do this. So uh, yeah, I'm just starting to build up some gigs, but uh, I'll probably get a few more readings put together for this book because I just really believe in this book and I want more people to know about it 
So I'll probably go to Butte, Dillon, uh, see if I can get back into, uh, I did a reading in Missoula at Shakespeare, but I'll probably get down to, try to get down to fact and fiction. But you, oh, you can find out where I'm going to be. Go to ednor.com. Ednor.com. Well, somehow it wasn't a big land rush for that URL. Are, are there any questions on the Zoom, Galen? Okay, so I have to ask a question because I got to flip through Montana Curiosities, my personal copy last night. There's a lot of curiosities in Deer Lodge um, in that book. Have you spent a lot of time in Deer Lodge? Is there any of those that you would like to share? Oh, man. Well, I, will, I had an uncle who was a guest of the state when the, uh, the old, old prison was operating. But yeah, I've, I went to... Uh, I wrote a story for uh, The Independent about, this is my favorite one. They have an incredible museum complex there. My favorite is the car museum, because I love uh, 70s cars. But uh, the prison, the old prison, looks like the best deal. It's just like this gothic, scary, creepy, and uh, there's no power and there's no heat. And you can go through there and, and self-tour it, but on Halloween, they, they usually give a Halloween special tour, starts at midnight. And if you go into the lobby, they have all the, you know, doodads and gifts and candy and stuff. And they've got some photos you can look at from the old prison days. And here's the guys working in the prison shop. And they're all, you know, for the midnight Halloween one, they put those away and they bring out the black and whites that the cops won't let them show to normal people. Well, here's an inmate got his head bashed in with a gun butt. Like, oh my God. <laughs> It's just, it, then it's, it's uh, so I did the tour to write about it for the Independent, and so the tour guide's wearing the pr the full-on prison stripes in the hat. She's like, "This is very cool." And uh, they take us out. We're doing the tour, and the, the, this is super grisly stuff. That like uh, uh, this stairway leads down here. The first cell block was here, the, the ground you're standing on. So we'll walk around this area and walk over here to go around it to the next building. By the way, you're walking on the original graveyard. Like, oh! <laughs> well, we moved all the bodies. You know, they actually, they only found uh, 24 of the 27. But anyway, we're going to go down to the... So we go into... Look, this stairway leads down what they call the hole, which was the isolation cell where prisoners would go, which was ne next to the boiler room. The temperature in the hole was usually in the 90s. Guys would stay there for 48 hours, three days, whatever. Till one on Halloween night, of course, one poor guy, his uh, heart exploded. And so they hauled him up out of there. That was the last time they used the hole. And then the second tour guide, was, who was kind of the, the tail gunner of the group, I'm, I'm in the back with my notebook just to fly in the wall. He le leans over and says, yeah, when they took the temperature of his kidney, it was 155 degrees. <laughs> just this, I'm like, oh, man, don't tell me that. So we, we get to the end of the tour, and the, there's a bunch of paranormal geeks with all their EMPs and all the gear and, you know, the, going around looking for, for ghosts. And I'm, I'm just kind of taking it all in. And she says, okay, this is Turkey Pete's cell. Turkey Pete uh, was an inmate here forever. He died in the prison. He's the only prisoner ever to have a funeral inside the prison. It's very famous, a well-known story. She's telling us this. She goes, I'm going to leave you guys now. Go back to the gift shop. And you're free to wander the rest of the, the prison grounds, you know, it, 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 as long as you want. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you're quiet enough, you might hear Turkey Pete saying something. And she went out the door, and I beat her back to the gift shop. <laughs> I could not wait to get out of there. There's <laughs> something, I, I did a thing in Butte where I did the ghost trolley tour and they brought us to an old miner's cabin. I'm like, this was after my book came out. I'm like, yeah, I'm objective. If I see something, I see something. I'm not a big, you know, uh, proponent of all this. We're sitting in this little cabin. The guy puts a flashlight on the shelf. He goes, okay, uh, Prospector Tom, these two guys, the high school teachers are the tour guys. We come in here, we bring people in here. Prospector Tom's spirit lives in here, and uh, sometimes we'll ask them a question, and they'll flick the light on and off. And I'm like, yeah, trick flashlight, I've seen this. 
oh, this is just a, a mag light, takes the batteries out, puts them back in, turns it on, turns it off, sets it on the shelf. I don't see any wires or controls in the guy's, guy's hands. Okay, uh, Prospector Tom, are you here right now? And there's like eight people packed into this little tiny cabin. I'm kind of leaning against the stove. It's, you know, uh, September, the stove's not lit. So I'm, I'm leaning back and, uh, yeah, can we move on to the next thing? See the next thing. And, uh, uh, well, this goes on for like th three, four minutes. Uh, then he says to the, the people, like, sometimes he just doesn't want to talk. You know, I'm, I'm sure that explains why your trick is not working. Well, <laughs> sometimes he doesn't want people here. Prospector Tom, are you angry that people are here? The light comes on. I stood up, said, nope, and just strode out the door. Everybody's like, no. He's like, no, come out. Nope. Not having it. <laughs> Any other questions, though? Oh, can I make it? Yes, you sir. briefly mentioned uh, Blackfeet by the city of Browning. Do yeah. you have, in your travels around the state, any other good stories from our reservations, from our tribal nations? Well, uh, one that I wrote about in, uh, thank you for that question, by the way. She wants to know if I have any other stories about uh, reservations and tribal members. One that have probably affected me the most was uh, when I told a few friends about I got this contract for uh, seven Montanas. They said, they were from Haver, and they said, well, you should write about the racism in Haver. And I've been to Haver, I, I, there's, it's pretty racist. Oh my God, yeah. And, and well, I'll have to check it out. So I started looking into it. Haver had a reputation as the most racist town one of the most racist in the country. And I, I never heard of this. So I drove up there, and the first place I went was to Rocky Boy Reservation. Drove around, uh, went through Box Elder, uh, stopped and had a bite, talked to a couple people, went to the uh, casino, the Northern Winds Casino, which is the biggest casino in the region. And the parking lot is full of weeds, and nobody's there. there's like three cars there. I went in and talked to the manager, and these were all tribal members. I talked to a guy who uh, that runs the radio station on the res, and they said, yeah, it's, it's always been there. It's like Haver seven miles away. Uh, one guy says, I'll drive to Fort Benton 56 miles away so I don't have to go to Walmart and hear people call me and, uh, you know, all these names and say go back to the res. And yet Haver, the town, has lost Kmart. They've lost Sears. They've lost the ticketing on Amtrak. Uh, they're hang, kind of hanging by a thread, but a million dollars a year comes in from the two reservations, Fort Belknap to the east and Rocky Boy. The tribes are keeping this town alive. So I talked to the Chamber of Commerce uh, president in Haver, and she said, yeah, as soon as, I'm aware of that, I grew up here, as soon as I got in my, this position, I got an audience with the tribal council on Rocky Boy. And I told them, look, we appreciate your business. We need your business. We'll die without your business. Uh, we we, we want to take steps to tar start to turn this thing around. Uh, we invite you to join our Chamber of Commerce, you know, with your own businesses. And I think one or two took, took her up on that right away. So things are, are peop the conversation is there. But uh, listening to people tell their own stories, I, I drove down the road to Malta and uh, did a thing there, and the uh, museum director says, I told her about, she said, there's no racism up here, this white lady. I said, you know, th this is part of what I do, is I'm, I don't feel like I'm a teacher or any of that stuff, but I am sharing these stories and laying out some information so these conversations can happen. And I did not paint Haver with a broad brush. There are a lot of people who are aware of the problem and trying to fix the problem within their own families, which is the only way it's going to happen. Because when, when kids grow up, Indian kids or white kids, and their parents and grandparents have said things like, oh, those white people, you can't, you know, they're going to steal whatever you leave at the thing. Or, or, you know, white people say, oh, Indians just don't, they get that big fat check every month, so they just get drunk. And it's like, no, you've got to learn about the other culture. You know, like maybe go to a powwow and, and kind of see what that's about. You know, so uh, I, uh, my, 
my, uh, my best friend is a, a tribal member of Flathead Salish. And when I met this guy in 86, he just, biggest influence I ever had. And uh, kind of changed the way that I look at the world and the way that I look at the, the land that I walk on. And uh, it's like indigenous peoples had it right. They were doing fine for, you know, 50,000 years, 20,000 years on this continent. And then we come along, it's like, uh, when farmers tell me that they quote the Bible and say, hey, we have dominion over the land, it says right here, it's like, well, that's a pretty recent document according to the people who were here first. So that stuff affects me deeply. And uh, when I was leaving the res for the last time, heading home, Oh, this is so corny and so unbelievable. Uh, I have the radio on, and Half Breed by Cher comes on. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm alone. I'm going to pull over and cry. <laughs> just spurred on by this, this dopey-ass song. <laughs> but it's, you know, you never know what's going to trigger you. But it's, I feel like I am learning, constantly learning. And there is a chapter in this book about how the triple... The uh, Little Shell tribe of Chippewa uh, got their federal recognition a couple years ago, and that just released a flood of funding and opportunity for this tribe that hasn't had a home for like 400 years. And they don't have a reservation to speak of as of yet, but it was a big step. And I think, although part of me says this is not your story to tell, Mr. White Privilege, uh, I think people need to know the story. So uh, I talked to a good friend of mine who is a uh, member of that tribe, and uh, he put me on a lot of passive information and people to talk to to get the story from the tribal members. So I tried to relay that as respectfully as I could without putting my own voice into it. And uh, yeah, that's really an important part of everything I do since that first book was try to tell the some indigenous perspectives on these stories, include them in the narrative. Thank you. Thank you. Come up here for a second. Um, that was actually a great segue because um, Chris Latre will be with us in two weeks. I've heard of Chris Latre. Yeah, I thought you might. Yeah. He's the guy. He's the guy. Um, <laughs> Um, next week, uh, Lauren Flynn will be talking to us about community and storytelling. And most, a lot of folks here know Lauren from his role as um, the executive director here at Traveler's Rest. And now he's the recreation manager for the entire region of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Chris Latre in two weeks and in three weeks, Deborah Magpie Erling will be here. Um, and I think we have a great season coming up, and I'm so grateful to Ed Nor for kicking it off so beautifully today. Um, he will be outside selling and signing books. Please visit with him. And um, that project that you have coming up about the roads of Montana, there might be a few people in this room that have some roads to mention to you. I am all ears. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of the low, low motorway people. Um, all right, so again, thank you so much for coming out today. Thanks to everybody on Zoom for joining us, and we will see you next week. Thank you.